We, we can get started. Um, so my name is Benjamin Mahler. I've been working on Mesos for the past three years at Twitter. So needless to say, I'm really happy to see so many people at the conference this year. Um, and as Ben alluded to in the keynote, um, I'm going to be talking about maintenance primitives. And maintenance primitives are a really important step for the project in terms of automation and making sure that we can do uh, maintenance in an easy way on our clusters. So um, I wanted to do a little bit of audience participation. Um, raise your hand if, if you're directly responsible for doing maintenance on uh, your clusters at your company. OK, so keep, keep your hands up. And put your hands down if you've never caused an outage doing that. OK, a couple hands went down. OK, so I hope you'll be interested in what I'm about to talk about then. Um, so for everyone in the room who's not aware, um, I want to try to refine what we mean when we talk about maintenance. And when we think about maintenance in Mesos, it's really anything that is going to affect the tasks on a machine. So um, at one point in time, restarting the agent actually consisted of maintenance as well. But these days, if you restart the agent, everything remains running. And so we're not really thinking about something like that in this context. We're thinking about things like if you need to take the machine offline for hardware repair, or if you need to do a kernel upgrade, or some configuration changes that aren't compatible, all these things are going to require draining that machine of, of tasks. So when I was thinking about how I wanted to give this talk, um, I think the best way to give some context around this is to look at the history of how we, how we thought about maintenance primitives. And that's uh, through running Aurora at Twitter. Um, Aurora is our platform as a service for long-running services and cron jobs. Um, and what's really important for maintenance is it encourages design, it encourages fault, uh, services to have a fault-tolerant design. That helps us a lot in the context of maintenance. That means we can restart services with relative ease. Um, and Aurora has some maintenance primitives built in. And I wanted to explore some of the history around that so that we can see you know, what, what can we learn from these primitives when thinking about Mesos? So here's your typical Mesos cluster. You know, at Twitter, we run tens of thousands of the agents here. And we run a lot of services under Aurora. So because we try to have pretty good utilization, it's not the case that there's going to be a lot of machines sitting here empty. So when we're thinking about maintenance, you know, every machine effectively is running something. So we have to figure out a solution which is going to help us in this kind of environment. And so one of the properties of Aurora that uh, is helpful to us, especially in the early days, was this concept of rack aware scheduling. So what I mean by that is, you know, because we run a, uh, we're not running on public clouds, we have this concept of racks on, for our agents. And so agents are organized into racks. And this is useful because racks are a fault domain. So there's going to be a top of rack switch. And if that fails, you're going to lose all of the agents on a particular machine. So this concept of rack aware scheduling is if you, if you want to launch some uh, instances of a service, you want to make sure that there's good rack diversity. And this means minimizing the number of agents you're going to put on the same rack. So you're going to try to spread these across racks. And so this kind of dovetails nicely into this concept of rack aware maintenance, where you know, let's say we're thinking, OK, how can we upgrade the kernels in our cluster? Well, we can just go rack by rack, right? Because we know that within a rack, we're not going to have every instance of a particular service. When we take down that rack, we're unlikely to cause an outage. So OK, let's run through our, what our little operator here is going to do. So we're going to you know, drain this first rack. Aurora is going to detect that there was a, a failure. It's going to replace that task on the next rack. Okay. Now we move along. Same thing happens. We detect the failure. We're going to put it on rack C, so on and so forth. Back to rack A. And great. We did a great job here. Except that you know, we restarted the service four times, n times effectively. So that's not great. A service owner is not happy at all. Um, and so. That introduced this notion of maintenance awareness when doing scheduling. So the basic idea here is you know, 
when we're an operator and we're going to do maintenance, we had a plan in that previous situation. We were planning to go through the racks in that order. So let's just tell the scheduler about you know, which racks we're going to do maintenance on. So this time, we're going to be smarter about it. We're going to tell the scheduler, OK, we're, all of these racks are scheduled for maintenance. Now the scheduler is going to mark them as undergoing maintenance, and it's going to do scheduling based on that. So this time, you know, we go through A. We update the scheduler. A is no longer in maintenance mode. Now when we go to rack B, and we need to reschedule this task, Aurora is going to prefer rack A, because rack A is not going to go under maintenance soon. Which, so now you know, we move along. Great. Everything was you know, all peachy this time. Except that um, service owners have, you know, are still complained because they have some higher level SLA. That's effectively what they care about. They don't care about the fact that we restarted it you know, three times or two times. They have a higher level SLA. They need to respond to a certain number of requests successfully. And so that's what they really care about. So this isn't quite enough. And so the idea here is you know, we need to be able to give SLA guarantees to service owners when doing maintenance. So uh, you know, that introduced this concept of SLA aware maintenance into Aurora. And the basic idea around this is, all right, well, how about we just ask the scheduler about SLA? And in the context of Aurora, this is uptime for now. So uptime is a pretty good uh, uh, metric to use for services where you want to keep them up and running. So now we, you know, we come to a machine, and this time you know, there's all these services running. We're not sure if this is safe to drain. We're going to just ask the scheduler, what, what's the uptime for these services? So let's say in this context, you know, they all have four nines of uptime. Then we know it's okay, safe, safe to drain that machine. So we wanted to look at all this and, and see, you know, what when applying, when adding maintenance primitives to Mesos, you know, what are the lessons we can learn? And uh, there's sort of two key lessons here. The first is we need maintenance awareness when doing scheduling, and the implication of that is schedulers need to be told about what we're going to do. As we saw, you can make better scheduling decisions when the scheduler is aware of what maintenance you're going to do. The second is, it's really up to the scheduler to tell us if maintenance is safe to proceed with or not. Mesos itself is not aware of all the different semantics and SLAs that schedulers have, and so we really need to be able to ex explicitly ask schedulers about maintenance. And you know, generalizing a bit further from Aurora and you know, some of these are going to apply to Aurora as well, but uh, there's a, a whole host of other challenges that arise when you're doing different kinds of, of workloads. So imagine you have short-lived tasks. These are tasks that might take you know, a couple minutes, and they're finished, like cron jobs. Uh, now, you might actually want to use resources that are going to go into maintenance if you have enough time to finish that cron job. So that's kind of like a cheap resource you can use that other people might, want, might not want to leverage. Let's say you have stateful services. And in this context, I don't mean persist, persisting storage, but uh, things like memcache. So memcache doesn't have the same characteristics as services. Memcache needs to be warmed up. And that might actually take hours. So in that context, the SLA you might care about is you know, how many memcaches do I have that are warm? And I need to make sure that I have enough warm memcaches at any point in time. Um, storage systems are additionally challenging. Um, these are things that use volumes. And so these can't be moved to another machine. When you're doing maintenance, the storage system needs to decide, do I, am I OK with that resource going away for, say, one hour? Or do I need to re-replicate that data? If it's going away for, let's say, a day or permanently, they're going to lose that data and they need to take action. So they might need to re-replicate in that case. So for storage systems, an awareness of how long maintenance is going to happen is very critical. So you know, when thinking about Mesos as an operating system, you know, operating systems are things that provide common services to the applications running on top. It makes a lot of sense. You know, like, let's add maintenance primitives in Mesos. So when we started looking at this project, we set out to to um, achieve a certain set of goals. And I'm going to go over each of these um, further. So 
the first goal is to enable maintenance awareness when doing scheduling. And as we saw with Aurora, this is really important. Um, and what this means is we need to keep the scheduler informed at all times of when maintenance is going to happen and for how long. And this part is critical for storage, as I mentioned. And you know, as we saw from the examples, planned maintenance is better than ad hoc maintenance. So if you have a plan of what you're going to do, it's more likely that schedulers are going to be able to go along with that plan. If you're doing it ad hoc, as we saw in that very first example, the scheduler is not able to make an intelligent decision about where to place that task next. The second goal is we really need to avoid outages from maintenance. And as we saw before, this means that we need an explicit, explicit decision from the scheduler. So we need to have the scheduler use its concept of SLA to tell us if maintenance is safe or not. And the second thing is, you know, this is a kind of a general design decision in Mesos is we won't kill any tasks from Mesos itself. It's really up to the schedulers to do that because it's ultimately the schedulers that know that it's safe. And of course, operators can force this if, if something is going wrong or if you know, they know better in a certain situation than the scheduler does. And so the last one is um, we want this to be able to, to be controlled by operators. Operators are ultimately the ones doing maintenance. And so they need to be able to be in control of it. Um, and so it's really hard to actually design maintenance primitives in a way that is very uh, automated inside Mesos because maintenance has a lot of policy built into it. So app different companies have different policies about how they do maintenance. They do it in different ways. And so what we wanted was to build something very simple that is very flexible. So it, simple primitives that operators can build tooling and automation on top of, not push too much of the complexity into Mesos. And so uh, the, the core of the idea for this is um, this concept of maintenance schedules. So OK, let's dig in and take a look at what that looks like. So for operators, um, when they're thinking about maintenance for a mach particular machine here, machine A, um, they construct a maintenance window for that machine. Okay? And maintenance windows have a start time and they have a duration. Okay? And this duration is you know, a conservative estimate of how long they think that maintenance is going to take. Um, and the, of course, the start time is also you know, should be respected by the operator. And so what they do is they can construct a schedule of their choosing Ideally, in this case, like let's say that's a rack, and so they're going to group machines on a rack together. And they send that to the master. So they set a maintenance schedule, and Mesos will persist that. So now we've got this maintenance schedule inside Mesos. What are we going to do with this? So the question is, you know, how, how are we going to communicate this stuff to, to the frameworks? So um, thinking about Mesos as a resource management system. Uh, Mesos is responsible for allocation of resources, deallocation of resources. And interestingly, we don't have a, a primitive right now for, for deallocation. So when we were thinking about this, we realized that maintenance looks a lot like deallocation. So we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could reuse some general deallocation primitives? So the idea here is, you know, if we use general primitives for deallocating resources, we can, re we can reuse these primitives to do other kinds of functionality in the future. For example, like defragmentation. So let's say you're running on EC2 and you want to uh, migrate your workload onto fewer machines. You need cooperation from the schedulers to do that. Much like in the same way with maintenance, you need to ask schedulers if deallocation is safe. And things like fairness and quota enforcement. So today, if, I don't know if you ever encountered this, but DRF can't make a deallocation. And so when DRF makes a decision about fairness, if a state changes in the cluster and the fairness is no longer respected, we can't do anything to correct that. So deallocation would allow us to preserve fairness in the, ch in, in the, in the case of changing circumstances. And so. Um, we want to introduce this notion of inverse offers. Now, um, remember that offers are the way that we uh, 
allocate resources to frameworks. You know, we, we send an offer and we ask the framework, would you like to use these resources? The framework can accept or decline. And conversely, inverse offers are the, are the inverse of that. So rather than saying, you know, would you like to use these resources, we're, we're asking, can you please give these resources back? Okay, so using this primitive, the API for maintenance consists of two parts. The first was the inverse offer that I mentioned, and that's gonna include you know, which resources need to be deallocated. In the case of maintenance, that's actually the whole, all the resources on the agent. Um, it's gonna include an unavailability, unavailability window, which was the maintenance window that I mentioned earlier. And much like an offer, the scheduler can accept or decline. And we also need to augment offer. And this is so that when schedulers are making scheduling decisions, before they place the task on that, on that machine, they need to know, you know, is it gonna go into maintenance? So um, to make this a little more concrete, I wanted to go through an example workflow, what this looks like. So let's say we have our machine, we have our friendly operator here. Um, we wanna do some maintenance on this machine. So we set a maintenance schedule and there's nothing running on this machine. So what's gonna happen is this framework's gonna get some offers for this machine. Now, in this case, the offers are actually gonna contain an unavailability window. So the scheduler's gonna see that these resources are gonna become unavailable at 5 p.m. for an hour. So based on this information, the scheduler can decide whether it still wants to use these resources. So let's say that, that that's all it has, so it has to, okay? So it's gonna launch some tasks. Now, now we have some tasks running on this machine and we're, we wanna do maintenance on it, right? So we're gonna try to deallocate these resources. So any resources on a machine that are used or reserved are gonna have inverse offers sent for them. So in this case, you know, we're gonna send an inverse offer. It's gonna say, hey, these, the resources on this agent are gonna become unavailable. Can you please deallocate? And the scheduler can wait until the, you know, close to the window if it chooses. So the scheduler can do two things here. It can accept or it can decline and it can say why. In this case, maybe there's an SLA violation or something like that. And so accepting and declining is actually, it doesn't have a, an effect on the system. It's a signal for operators. So operators can see, you know, what did the scheduler say about this? And the reason it doesn't have an effect on the system is because, as I said earlier, we don't want Mesos to actually kill the tasks here. If a scheduler accepts the deallocation, it's still the scheduler's responsibility to terminate those tasks. Okay, so that's really important. We don't want Mesos to kill things because uh, then we're gonna be blamed for outages and stuff like that. Um, okay, so now you know maintenance comes along. So we're inside the maintenance window now. And now what we're gonna do as an operator is proceed based on the current state of the system. So we can ask questions about the state. And the first thing we're gonna see is, you know, are there any tasks running here? Yes, okay, well, if there's tasks running, well, then we shouldn't proceed. It's not safe. We don't really know if it's safe. We can further ask, you know, did the scheduler accept or not to try to figure out what went wrong here. But um, I wanna look at another example where let's say we're running Cassandra. So this is a storage system and there's not actually any tasks running here, but these are volumes, okay? So there's reserved volumes on this machine. And so when we see there's no tasks running, that's not enough. We're gonna see, okay, are there any reserved resources? Yes, so it's not, we don't have enough information at this point to know if it's safe because Cassandra might be wanting to get back to those resources. Let's say their, their worker process has just crashed, right, and they wanna restart them immediately. We might, we might accidentally take out this machine when Cassandra wanted to still use it. So the next thing we're gonna ask is, you know, what, what did Cassandra say about the deallocation? In this case, you know, let's say it actually did wanna use it, it's gonna say, okay, you know, I need two of three replicas online and this will violate that. So if, if you take out this machine, I'm not gonna have two of my three replicas up and running. So yeah, we shouldn't proceed in this case, it's not safe. Alternatively, you know, so let's go through the workflow of what it looks like when Cassandra is okay with maintenance. In this case, Cassandra accepted the maintenance, it killed its tasks, there's nothing running, we're good to go. So note that because there's a finite window here, Cassandra is going to be assuming that it's gonna get these resources back. So let's say we could do a kernel upgrade, okay, we're done, we, we clear the schedule in Mesos, now 
Cassandra is going to get an offer and relaunch these tasks. And everything's good to go. So in this case, you know, it's running back on the machine. There was a window of unavailability, but it could tolerate it because its SLA wasn't going to be violated. So it had two of its three replicas online. The other replicas were, weren't under maintenance, and so we could go ahead and do this maintenance. Okay, so let's look over the goals that we had and how this, how this um, accomplishes them. So because of we augment the offers and we introduce inverse offers, the scheduler always knows when maintenance is going to happen on resources that it's involved with and for how long. And because schedulers can decline maintenance, we're incentivizing maintenance planning over ad hoc maintenance because operators are going to find it more difficult to do maintenance when they're doing it in an ad hoc fashion. If they do a plan, it's more likely that schedulers are going to accept the plan. So the second was avoiding outages. So because we have an explicit decision here, we're, you know, it's the scheduler's responsibility. We're putting it in the hands of the scheduler to tell us if it's safe. So if the schedulers are implementing SLA awareness correctly, we're going to be avoiding outages because of this stuff. And keep in mind that, yeah, Mesos is not going to go and kill things in an automated fashion. And because these are very simple raw primitives, um, you can do all kinds of, of maintenance policy on top of it. You could do planned maintenance. You could do ad hoc maintenance. You can you know, do whatever your works at your particular company. Let's say you're running on EC2 and there's, you, know, you get notified that there's a maintenance window happening. You can just you know, feed that into Mesos and we can deal with it that way. And uh, yeah, I mean, automation can be built on top in a custom way. So just the vi when I wanted to mention the, like, the vision for this project, like why it's so important to do this. Uh, I really think it's like a, a critical step forward for Mesos. So Mesos is already automated and um, uh, you know, lowers the operational overhead for your company, but we don't really have continuous delivery for operations uh, people as well. So upgrading a kernel is still not the easiest thing, especially if you're running you know, a critical production cluster. You can't, you, know, you can't upgrade that kernel. It takes maybe like you know, a month or something. So the second part is this is really critical for multi-framework. So imagine, I mean, most of these situations I ran through, there's a single framework here. Imagine you have multiple frameworks. So in this case, you have Cassandra and an Aurora service running and Jenkins jobs running. It gets much more difficult to figure out if maintenance is safe to do. And, and we need a common set of maintenance primitives to deal with it. And the last is, you know, because we're introducing inverse offers as part of this, uh, we can reuse these, we can reuse inverse offers for other functionality in the future, as I alluded to. All right, so um, that's about all I had. I wanted to thank a couple of the contributors from, from Mesosphere. They've been doing a lot of work on this stuff lately. Yo Joseph, Artem, and Yoris. Um, there's a design doc that we've published as well, so if you have any feedback about it, please do give us feedback. We always enjoy that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all I had. If I, I'm happy to take questions now. Okay, so, I, yeah, so I, yeah, okay, so that's what I thought you were asking. So the question was, you know, can you have indefinite maintenance on machines? And yes, so the window is optionally infinite, right? So if you have an infinite window, the scheduler knows that those resources are not going to come back, right? Um, and that might happen in, in certain situations, like hardware repair. You don't really know how long that's going to take. It's unlikely that you should even bother trying to guess that. Right, yep. Yeah.
Um, I think you're, you're asking about like why the distinction about volumes? Okay, uh, I don't, don't think I quite get the question, to be honest. Okay, sorry. Yep, we can chat after. Uh, you? Yeah. Do you have a, um, rescinded reverse offers? Meaning, uh, it's okay to, you know, I accept the maintenance window and then now the shop is between now and the maintenance window happens, and now it's not okay anymore? Yeah, so uh, the question is do you have a concept of rescinding? inverse offers, and yes. So there, one of the reasons it's named inverse offers as opposed to something maybe more obvious to people is um, it, it, it shares the same mechanisms as offers in terms of message communication. So we can send an inverse offer, we can pull it back by resending it, much like we do with offers. So if we send an inverse offer and the operator says, like, I don't want to do maintenance anymore, we can just resend that. Okay, and the scheduler is going to see that, OK, this went away. Um, so yes, we can resend them, and we can also keep resending inverse offers if the scheduler is not actually killing its tasks. The same way we keep sending offers when a scheduler is not wanting to use the resources. Yep. Would a dynamic reservation persist across maintenance periods? Yeah. So um, we actually the question is. Uh, would a dynamic reservation persist across maintenance periods? And yeah, because dynamic reservations uh, live outside of a, the lifetime of a particular agent. Dynamic reservations actually live across uh, agent ide identifying uh, agent IDs. So if you restart an agent, you wipe all its state. As long as the, the information about dynamic reservations is still checkpointed, that new agent is going to have dynamic reservations and volumes available. So it's more at the machine level, reservations and volumes. And so um, if you go into a kernel reboot, it's going to be a brand new agent. But because the disk has survived, there's still going to be reservations and volumes there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. Anyone else? No? Yep. Is there any at least support for this in Aurora Marshes? Is there any what, sorry? At least support for this in Aurora. Yeah, so is there any, the question was, is there any support for this in Aurora? So everything I talked about in the context of Aurora exists inside Aurora. The challenge was, you know, at Twitter, we wanted to move towards multiple frameworks. So, you know, Aurora specific maintenance didn't work in the context of multi framework or storage systems or other systems. So we were trying to, push down this common functionality into, into Mesos. But yeah, you can go and use maintenance functionality in Aurora today. The difference, I would say, one of the key differences is in Aurora, it's a binary switch between this machine is in a maintenance mode or not. Aurora doesn't have an understanding of what order or when. And so the scheduling is more limited because of that. But you can model the binary switch on the schedule model. Yep. Yeah. So, so if it happens in between like that, the scheduler is still able to say, the scheduler still has time to say, no, I don't want maintenance to happen because something unexpected happened, right? So if a scheduler defers it, its actual killing of the tasks, right? So there's a couple ways this could play out. If the scheduler reschedules immediately, right, it's already on another rack, right? But if it's, if it's um, if it didn't reschedule and it's waiting, and that, and that third rack went down, 
the scheduler can still say, okay, wait, never mind, no. This is because we keep sending the inverse offers if they're not actually, if there's still resources in use. So the scheduler gets, keeps getting a chance to answer. Okay, sure. Yeah, so that's why, like, let's say you have a replica-based system. So the, so the question was, like, what happens if, let's say, a scheduler places it on a, on a third rack, the third rack goes down, and so you have two replicas running at this point? You have only one. You have only one, you want to run two. Yeah, so um, if you have a replica-based system, right, let's say you have three replicas of a piece of data, um, you really want to have at least two replicas so you can tolerate one unplanned failure, right? So when you've got that one replica, you're in that dangerous position, right? So that's an unplanned failure happened. But you're still okay because you have one replica. Now you need to reschedule to get two back up, right? Or three, ideally. But yeah, you have to also think about not only the fact that there's going to be a planned failure for maintenance, but at any given time, an unplanned failure could happen. So, you know, most systems assume a certain statistical likelihood of these unplanned failures. And given that can make you know, reasonable trade-offs about what's the likelihood of a, a catastrophic failure happening versus you know, how many like, extra replicas should I keep, et cetera. Does that make sense? OK. OK, uh, I think that's it. All right, thank you. <laughs>